This is Ancient Faith Today with Father Tom Soroka, a weekly live call-in show addressing the issues of our day from a distinctly orthodox perspective. You can join the conversation by calling in at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Father Tom is the priest at St. Nicholas Orthodox Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and welcomes guests from across the globe to discuss important topics of interest. Here's Father Tom. Welcome to Ancient Faith Today Live. This is Father Tom Soroka, and I'm so glad that you're with us this evening. We'll be taking your calls in a bit at 1-855-AF-RADIO. That's 1-855-237-2346. As usual, Matushka Trudy will be there to answer your calls, so please make sure, if you do call, to turn the show volume off before you come on air. Now, you can send us a text message. People really like that. In fact, we already have several text messages for tonight's show. Send that right from your smartphone, 412-206-5012. That's 412-206-5012. Of course, you can also participate online on the AFM YouTube and Facebook pages. We'll be monitoring those. So if you'd like to make some comments, we're happy to catch those and to answer them or read them there. Of course, you can also send us an email at aft at ancientfaith.com. So let's get started. It's a bit difficult to know where to start when discussing the topic of transgenderism. That is, according to those who are proponents of transgenderism, at the root of it is what is called gender dysphoria, the sense that a person's sense of their own gender does not align with their physical sex. Today, sadly, this more and more frequently ends in the chemical and surgical process to alter their physical body, that is, to believe make it align with their sense of gender. Now, to be clear from the outset, I am not a physician, I am not a psychologist, and there are a host of issues to deal with in this matter. Ultimately, we want to discuss this from an Orthodox Christian moral, ethical, and theological perspective. And that's why they're, we're calling this show Transgenderism and Orthodox anthropology. As Orthodox Christians, our worldview must be informed by the truths revealed by God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. So for us, this is not a political issue, but this is an issue that strikes at the very heart of what it means to be human. Now, in order to frame the conversation with our guest tonight, we need to look at some facts first. For instance, the issue of binary sex, that is, that there is male and female. This issue has been co-opted by those who are kind of controlling the official social narrative. They say that gender is simply your feelings as a male or female, and that the idea of binary male or female is just a narrative of our oppressive patriarchal Western culture. So they go on to say that gender is fluid or gender is a spectrum, or today they're talking about uh, gender being a, a even beyond a spectrum, that it is unlimited, and that you may be one or many, I suppose, of many possible genders. And that may change over time. Now, as of 2017, that's six years ago from the date of this program, Facebook itself offered 70 different genders by which someone could self-identify. They do this in support of the official, quote-unquote, social narrative. Even medical associations are speaking of your sex as being assigned gender at birth, as if it were something 
arbitrarily done by ignorant doctors and uncaring parents. But the fact of the matter is, while we do, as Orthodox Christians, recognize only two sexes and two genders, everyone agrees, and this is just common sense, that the feeling or the sense of gender is stronger in some and weaker in others. In other words, if you are a male, your maleness may feel at times stronger or weaker, and your sense of maleness may be stronger or weaker than other males that you may know. However, no matter your inner sense of maleness, the truth is, if you have a male body, you are a male. The issue of physically intersex people, those who are born with clearly undefined sexual anatomy, is a far, far outlier. And it really doesn't change the reality that greater than 99% of people, according to the scientific literature, are male or female. But even those who do suffer from that malady want to live as male or female. Now, does that mean gender dysphoria doesn't exist? Of course not. In a world where many psychological maladies exist, we acknowledge as Orthodox Christians that gender dysphoria can certainly be one of those maladies. And that brings us to the second point. The second thing we have to acknowledge is the pace at which transgenderism is being pushed and accepted by the wider society, even the medical community, and most notably in schools to our children, by the media and the government. It's absolutely shocking and alarming. And no, this isn't an OK Boomer moment for me. Frankly, I'm barely a baby boomer. My date of birth is at the very, very tail end of the official year for boomers. Thank you very much. Everyone of goodwill and common sense acknowledges that the changes and the accommodations and laws and acceptable norms that are being altered right now is incredibly swift and should give us serious pause. These changes that are spreading through our society are doing irreparable harm to our children, to the rights of women, and to the minds of otherwise reasonable people. Now, if you want to learn more about this alarming subject, after the program, I would suggest two books. The first is Irre Ir Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters by Abigail Schreier, and The End of Gender, Debunking the Myths About Sex and Identity in Our Society by Deborah So. S-O-H. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about tonight. And the question on our mind is, why do we as Orthodox Christians think the way we do about sex and gender? And what's wrong with the, the transgender movement? What are the biblical, theological, and anthropological principles that we must understand in order to answer directly to those who believe that transgenderism is ultimately simply an issue of compassion and even human rights. So I'd like to welcome Father Herman Garrison. He's a priest at Nativity of the Lord Mission in Shreveport, Louisiana. He holds a bachelor's degree in sociology and is a 2020 graduate of St. Tikon Seminary. Additionally, he serves a new mission supported by the Shreveport Mission, which when you think about it is amazing. The Shreveport Mission is a mission, and they already have a spinoff mission. That's amazing. And he lives there with his wife and children. So we're going to get to know him. Father Herman, welcome to Ancient Faith Today Live. Thank you for having me. It's such, a, such an honor to be here. Uh, this really is a full circle moment for me. Uh, you know, my journey to orthodoxy was very much... Um, brought along by um, Kevin Allen's show, this show here. Um, Kevin was a wonderful uh, 
person for our family personally, may his memory be eternal. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is a full circle moment for me. Well, thank God. And uh, I do want to hear more about your journey to orthodoxy. Uh, I, I would direct people, if you want to hear the longer story, go to the Spirit of St. Tikhon's podcast where you were interviewed there. But tell me a little bit about yourself, your family, and your conversion to Orthodox Christianity. Yeah, so our conversion to Orthodox Christianity uh, started uh, about 13, 14 years ago. Uh, we were a young family. Um, just my oldest daughter uh, was born at the time. And we started to really, or I, I actually, me personally, uh, I was challenged by this notion of sola scriptura. And this was brought about by a family member who, who really challenged me to think about scripture in a different way. And, and he challenged me by saying, you know, why do you know the things that you know? And how do you know that the people that taught you were trustworthy? And, uh, you know, that was a question that I had to, to ask myself. And, and um, he brought up the Septuagint. And he said, uh, he said, the Septuagint is this translation of the Bible that's been hidden for most people. <laughs> well, of course, you know, I mean, we, we know we use it every day in the Orthodox Church, but uh, it really got me thinking about, you know, how scripture came about, translations of words, uh, and, and, you know, why they're so important. So I just, I basically Googled the Septuagint. It led me to a Wikipedia article about Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, I Googled that and up came Ancient Faith Radio. And I began listening to Father Andrew Stephen Damick's podcast and Ancient Faith Today, uh, Father Thomas Hopko, um, all the wonderful uh, podcasts on here. And then um, found an Orthodox pen pal online. Oh, wow. And he really, yeah, which was, it was actually, <laughs> I was I was active in, in forums and, and the forum had a, a religious section. And I, I typed in Eastern Orthodoxy and there was nothing there. So I started a thread and said, has anyone heard of this Eastern Orthodox Church? And the first reply was this uh, Antiochian uh, man who, who said, yes, I'm, I'm Antiochian Orthodox. What do you want to know? And we started an email chain and, and uh, you know, did that for about three months and uh, you know, was reading about it all the time, late at night, listening to podcasts. And uh, he, he, you know, and I said, I, I think I, I understand the Orthodox faith now. <laughs> I've read all about yeah, it. Right, I, and, right, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Very classic sort of inquirer yep. hubris there. Exactly. Um, and he said, no, 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 now you have to go visit. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> my wife and I made a made a plan to go visit and it was uh you know just a just felt the presence of the holy spirit there at that tiny little country parish as father michael of blessed memory liked to call it and um, um yeah and so that that began my journey to the orthodox church uh subsequently it was also beginning uh, my undergrad work uh, as well um, in in sociology uh, then Thank God, after I graduated from, uh, from that, uh, I was called to, to St. Tikhon's, and uh, we spent three wonderful years there at St. Tikhon's. Um, and and uh, uh, a, a, a time of many firsts. We, we were the first all-married class uh, in St. Tikhon's history. Wow. And oh, wow. We were, so, yeah, so that was a really special uh, special to to be able to um, have that group of, of brothers uh, go through through that together as as, as married men, and so uh, it was a it was a very special special group, and I love those guys. Um, and then of course the first, unfortunately, the first virtual graduation in Saint Tikhon's yeah. as many of of our listeners have have experienced. 
as well. Those must so. have been very difficult years to go through your schooling and, you know, have to do so much online, et cetera. That's, uh, I also well, felt very sorry for new priests that just got put yeah. into a parish and all of a sudden, you know, we're dealing with uh, a lot of stuff going on. Thankfully, it was just my last semester uh, when it, uh, when, whenever all that, that happened. So I was able to get the vast majority of my seminary experience uh, incarnationally, as Father John Parker uh, likes to likes to say. So that was that was a wonderful wonderful experience. Good. All right. Uh, so we're glad that you are with us and and uh, partaking of the Orthodox faith, and we wish you all the best down in your uh, your new assignment. And it's very very exciting down there. Just really amazing. So let's turn to the topic of transgenderism and orthodox anthropology. Uh, the first question that I would ask you is, why does this topic interest you so much? It interests me so much because I am a product of a generation that uh, perhaps has, has experienced this the most sharply. Um, you know, I'm reminded of a quote by G.K. Chesterton, uh, he wrote on certain modern writers in the institution of family. He said, they, the moderns, are seeking under every shape and form a world where there are no limitations. That is a world where there are no outlines, a world where there are no shapes. There is nothing baser than that affinity. They say they wish to be as strong as the universe, but they really wish the whole universe to be as weak as themselves. And I came across that quote as a young man and, and, wow. you know, experiencing for the first time, uh, this, this concept of, you know, what was formerly sort of science fiction, things like transhumanism, right. Um, was, was just sort of pulp fiction. And, um, you know, and as growing up as a fan of, of science fiction, uh, to, to start to see that, to, to start seeing that become kind of uh, um, uh, in our society, in you know our society was starting to point towards this. Our science, um, all these efforts were were pointed towards this this uh, idea that uh, you know we are sort of the the master of ourselves, and mm -hmm. um, you know I began to experience that shapelessness as a young person. And it produced so much anxiety in me. Uh, wow. Because there was no, you know, my faith before coming to, to the Orthodox Church was, of course, uh, uh, shaken. And, and I talk about that in the podcast a little bit, so I won't really go into that. But, you know, I was seeing so many things that were sort of solid ground melting away. And really we're, we're saying, okay, well, you know, where is this solid hmm. ground? Where is this? this anchor um, as, as things become, you know, fiction and half truths and hmm. um, you know, all the, the, you know, sort of the, the fake news as we like to say, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. is becoming so much more prominent, which was only just um, supercharged by the social media. Uh, I got into the internet very early uh, internet and technology and computers. They always fascinated me as a child. And right. our family was one of the very early adopters of, of the internet. Um, and uh, I had to ex describe the sound of a modem to my daughter the other day. But, <laughs> um, you know, and so going along and growing up with the internet, uh, I have been sort of in my own life as, as a, a case study of of sort of the, the power of the internet. Obviously, I've experienced it in a very positive way with shows like AFR and, um, and Ancient Faith Today and so on and so forth. But of course, experiencing the negative of it, uh, especially with social media. And, um, you know, and so uh, all of these things are getting supercharged by this technology and the science. And so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I was as I was working for a nonprofit at the time that was working with children, boys that had 
learning and behavioral disabilities. And we were seeing a trend, a very disturbing trend happening amongst the, the students that were, um, that were being referred to us. And, oh. and again, it was a lot of, a lot of depression and anxiety. And, um, uh, and so I really wanted to just find out sort of where was this all coming from? And, um, you know, I, I initially started looking into political science and then quickly shifted to, to sociology because uh, I was drawn to the field um, and trying to, to have a, a macro view of society, but also a micro. You know, I mean, it's, it, you can sort of go to any stratosphere and, and try to, to give expl- explanations as to why these things happen. And so this really led to my, my curiosity on the subject. Okay. And um, yeah, I did a, did a deep dive in my so, undergrad. So let, let me just follow up to that. You know, in terms of you, you said that you saw the, the, the sort of the slide toward what was at one time the, the themes of science fiction, transhumanism, and so forth, you know. And then you see humanity, you see society literally sliding into this. Why do you think it is? And, and this is sort of the last question before we actually get into the meat of this issue. Why do you think it is that so many people are so willing to accept the idea that gender is so fluid, that uh, so many people, you know, anyone that says uh, anything about their gender is, is that we have to uh, accept that, that they were born in the wrong body and that the medical community has now accepted that we're going to chemically and, and surgically change someone's body to quote unquote match their gender. Why do you think society has become so amenable to such what only 10, 20 years ago was such a bizarre idea? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think that if you look at the history of um, sociology, and especially, I mean, this, this affects education systems, it affects political systems, it affects all kinds of areas of life. You know, you had such a, a monumental shift in the 19th century. You know, of course, you have you know, Durkheim and Weber and Marx and Hegel and, you know, all of these people sort of uh, coming up with philosophies that are on the frontier of, of, you know, I mean, it's, it's a new sort of philosophy driven by, by science. I think this, this new, um, uh, you know, idea of, you know, man is sort of the, the, interesting. Uh, the, the center and, and, you know, and even in science fiction, this picks up right with, um, you have such a turning point with, um, uh, Dr. Frankenstein's monster, you know, the novel, um, it, it was so revolutionary that Mary Shelley actually had to release the book anonymously. Um, and because it was so horrifying, it was so horrifying to, to think about sort of experimentations with the body and, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, this, all of these new thought frontiers that are, are, are forming, they, they start competing with each other. And so you have people that are saying, well, you know, we have sort of these structures and each structure in society functions a particular way. And we need these things to function. Uh, and every society that you examine has a, a hierarchy and this hierarchy is necessary, you know, in this order and so on and so forth. And then you have other philosophers that come along and say, well, no, you know, really uh, the, the egalitarian model is, is 
the the highest ideal, this this progress, uh, and then there there comes about this shift of, of what I think is we have this totally different idea about power. So, you know, the 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 late 1800s, World War One, basically marks the end of sort of the 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 monarchy, our understanding of of ancient power structures and there's this n- totally new world where power is um, brought to to a you know a democracy a democracy becomes sort of um, and so people people are now have this power and they're saying well you know where does it come from what does it do what is it how has it been abused in the past and they start asking all of these questions and so I think that gets reduced down to uh, you have several philosophers uh, and social scientists in the in the 20th century that um, try to try to give a you know very critical reading to everything. Every institution is sort of put on the table and seen through this this critical lens. And so, right. um, so what happens is is, is of course. Um, Nothing is 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 sort of sacred, you know, in the sense of everything yeah. is is we have to investigate this power uh, and where it lies mm. and and so on and so forth. And and I will yeah. just say this as yes, you please. Know, I, I don't want to, um, you know, there are certainly some very good things that come from that. <laughs> you know, obviously, if if there are abuses yep. or you yeah. know. Th- uh, obviously, there are, uh, and we talk about with with gender roles, you know, in the sense of, um, you know, more fair and equitable treatment for people, uh, in the sense of understanding the image and likeness of God that is in them, you know, um, that that those are good things. But what happens is that then you have somebody like me who grows up in an education system that has zero understanding or even language to sort of talk about uh, a Christian anthropology. And so, you know, as a young person, I go through school and I'm sort of taught a, you know, if, if you are growing up in the South, <laughs> you know, I mean, in, in sort of uh, in the, in the, in, in more sort of conservative areas, you know, fundamentalism, literalism of the scriptures, you know, they start pitting against science versus the, versus the Bible, and that sort of devolves into to a dead end. And then, uh, then it gets sort of relegated to a, like a wink, like, yeah, you can, you can believe in, in the Bible, but really the scientific fact is that, that humans have evolved and that we're essentially reason-endowed apes. And so... Uh, you know, there, there's no concept of a telos other than, you know, whatever sort of, uh, as the Chesterton quote, <laughs> uh, critiqued about the moderns. And so there's, there's just no language. And so what that, what happens is the gospel, the scriptures get reduced to a social gospel to basically just, just moralism. And so I, mm-hmm. I open the scriptures and it teaches me how to be a, a good person. And, and that's really what society is now saying, uh, is starting to say is that, well, you know, your book is fine. Your faith is fine. It, you know, <laughs> teaches you not to, to steal. Right. It teaches you not to yeah. like, you know. Love everybody. Right. Love everybody. And then, and then so yep. what happens is that Jesus becomes the great moral teacher uh, yep. instead of the, the conqueror of death and the the sanctification of our of our human nature and so so there's no language for us to use and so as you sort of go off into this ether the shapelessness that our society has then yeah it's no wonder there is no there's no anchor point there's no it's a free-for-all and um i think that that's that's where a lot of people myself included as we come to the Orthodox Church, uh, we are are 
taken aback. We are awestruck. We are like, oh, this is Christians have been talking about this for 2000 years. <laughs> right, <laughs> that, right. That this is not something that's necessarily new to the church, uh, that she has been talking about human nature because that's the very thing that the evil one attacks uh, from the right. outset is, is Christ's humanity. And so, so Father, let's 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 stop let's stop there because we're we're kind of bleeding into the next section. Um, I want to remind our listeners: we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call at one eight five five AF Radio or send us a text message to four one two two zero six five zero one two. We have an interesting discussion going on in the uh, YouTube um, uh, chat place, <laughs> the chat space, and uh, welcome to everybody there. So we're kind of there was some comments about uh, transhumanism saying like, well, I thought the transhumanism was like, you know, implanting uh, uh, technology into humans to make them cyborgs or whatever. And essentially what, what I said, if you don't mind me answering for you, is that um, it seems like transgenderism is the in a way, the beginning of transhumanism, of a greater transhumanism, by using the, the technology of the current medical understanding to change the human body in order to align to, quote unquote, the mind or, or the feelings. And so in that sense, it's, it's a kind of subset of, of transhumanism. But I think your point is really well taken that um, the the emphasis that science somehow is the determiner of the progress of our humanity is then, uh, you know, tra transgenderism is turning to science and saying, you see, science can solve our problem, whereas religion, Orthodox Christianity cannot solve our problem. And right. what we're saying is, and, and what you said here is that, you know, unfortunately, people don't have the vocabulary anymore, or the the philosophical, theological framework uh, in in order to process this particular question. So what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to ask Matushka Trudy. We're going to go on a very quick break. Stay right there. Do not go away. We're only going to go away for a few seconds. We're going to have a quick break. When we come back, we're talking with Father Herman Garrison. We're going to talk now about if I want to explain to someone as an Orthodox Christian, here's why we believe what we believe. And, and I will say this also. This is where, and I don't know if you agree with me, Father, let me know. This is where we as Orthodox Christians, and I would say really all Christians, kind of missed, misstepped when the question of homosexual marriage came up. We were left flat-footed because we did not have the, the, the arguments and the vocabulary in order to clearly articulate and make our case as to why this was not good for the country. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I think that, yeah, um, yeah. It, it, like I said, I, when, th when, I think that's, that's where we're at now. Yes. Yeah. I, as I said, I think because we have reduced the scriptures to just the social gospel or moralism, right. Then it does become me just pitting my morals against yours. You know, and that's that's what sort of the competition is, is, well, I don't believe in your Bible. I don't believe in your these old outdated rules and regulations. And that's all it really right. is. And um, um, yeah, so I think that because we haven't really brought the language that's always been there, <laughs> but sort of the church has always had to uh, bring it in a fresh context with yes, this generation. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So we don't want to find ourselves uh, behind the eight ball here. We want to actually be able to give ourselves the the reasons for the hope that is within us. 
You are listening to Ancient Faith Today, and we will be right back. Father Tom will be back in a moment. In the meantime, the lines are open at 855-237-2346. Don't go away. This is Father Stephen Freeman. I'm happy to announce Ancient Faith's publication of my latest book, Face to Face, Knowing God Beyond Our Shame. Some modern therapists have described shame as the master emotion, one that colors and shapes our world in ways that we hardly imagine. The Christian tradition is no stranger to this and has a rich understanding of the ways this part of our inner life shapes our experience of the world. This book offers something of a roadmap to that inner life. What is shame? Is it always bad? Does it have any useful purpose for us? Join me in an exploration of knowing God beyond our shame, finding the true God whom the scriptures tell us did not turn his face from the spitting and the shame. Face to Face is now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We're back with Ancient Faith Today and Father Tom Soroka. Give us a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Father Tom. Welcome back to Ancient Faith Today. We're talking about transgenderism and Orthodox anthropology. We're talking with our guest, Father Herman Garrison. All right, Father, let's do this. Let us talk about the framework. How how would you begin making an argument for our understanding of the human person, why there are two genders, and why we should not uh, be encouraging uh, the this this spread of this social contagion of transgenderism? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, whenever it comes to the framework that often we are presented with, it's basically bodily and psychological. These are sort of the two components that we are, are, are sort of trained and brought up to, to really only think about. And so, uh, of course, whenever we speak of these things, uh, as you mentioned in your, your introduction, uh, the science can only really touch on the, the psychological um, and, of course, the, the, the biological um, as well, which, as you pointed out, uh, is, is pretty clear. <laughs> uh, but we're just presented with that framework. And so when we come to the Orthodox Church, uh, we can oftentimes only be thinking about these two parts of ourselves. Um, and there is, of course, a sort of a, uh, a reverse Gnosticism, you know, Gnosticism being the sense of in the, in the early church as she battled this Gnostic idea of, of you know, this secret knowledge that's only attainable through spiritual means and that the only right. thing that's holding us back is our, our, our bodies, you know, mm -hmm. matter is evil, matter is bad. Our bodies are, are to be discarded. And, um, you know, there's such a negative view of the body. And interestingly enough, ironically, that's still in place in, in also, worshiping the body as we do now and sort of neglecting the soul, um, we, it still loses its true value in, and, and realizing as St. As John Damascus says, the body and soul are inseparable for the person. I mean, they, that is the person is, is body and soul. And so it's only helpful for us to, to use it as, as, categories in discussion, but we can't even really say that, you know, they're separated in the sense of, um, you know, I am right. a, I'm, I'm a body yeah. that it can, <laughs> it for, that contains a soul or right, I'm a right. 
enfleshed soul, but you yeah. are a, you know, a living being is soul and body. Yeah. Can we stop there just for a second? Because th this is really important point. I love that you started there. In other words, <clears throat> when, when we say as Orthodox Christians that we are body and soul, mm -hmm. we do not say that we are like a, a you know, a, a, a meat sack that has right. a soul. We, we are completely and totally integrated. Every cell of our body is integrated with this soul. And our death, I'll even maybe finish the thought, our death is the disintegration of that soul and body. Precisely. Yeah, the, the, Orthodox, has a, uh, the Orthodox Church has a holistic view of the person. You know, whereas the world presents a very dualistic view. And I think that that is, that is important to understand how these, and again, I use air quotes, components, <laughs> you know, of our personhood, of, of who we are, uh, how they, they, they interact together to make us who we are. You know, it's very interesting because whenever we of course go to to genesis right and this is uh, you know where we first see god made uh, them in their in their in his image and likeness male and female he made them and saint john chrysostom just puts it so beautifully in his homilies on genesis and as he's expounding on this verse he says he, he first of all just points out there's a, there's a full stop there. There's a full stop. There is, God really wants to, to emphasize this. And I tell this to young people oftentimes because they do have this sort of mistrust of, of Genesis because they've been taught, or I've been taught my entire life, that it's, it's a nice story for me to believe in, but it conflicts with actual science and you know, in, right. in the real, quote yeah. unquote, real world. But St. Right. John Chrysostom says, uh, uh, or no, it might be St. Gregory, but they said, but basically Genesis is the story handwritten to you by God of what he wants to know, what he wants you to know about your, your personhood, about what you are created for. And so it is not it is not meant to be a science book. It is not meant to be a history book, even though it contains those two things, as Saint Basil and Hexameron and you know all of this he points out. But the point is is that God is trying to tell us something very specific with this, and he wants us to know this. And so what Saint John Chrysostom says, he says, notice that God is speaking to them before they are created bodily. And I think that that was, that was very profound for me because God is speaking to this, to, to human nature that biology aside, <laughs> you know, biology aside, that maleness and femaleness is something so much deeper than our biology. So science can come up with all kinds of ridiculous ways to tinker and and take things away and add things and modify and do all of these things, but it doesn't change who we are. It doesn't change who we are as a person. And so St. John Chrysostom says that it's, we have to see this with spiritual eyes. We have to see that, that God created this in his will, first of all, so that he willed this, and that, that the mystery of, of gender and it is a mystery. I mean, it's something that is deeper than sort of yeah, just our bodies. That's a good point. You know? Right. And that it is something that is prophetic, prophetic in the sense of that God is, is teaching us something deeper about this. And we have to humble ourselves and say, Lord, what are, what are you wanting to teach us about this? What are you wanting to pull us into this, this fullness, uh, you know, for? And so uh, he doesn't create this as, as sort of a plan B, <laughs> you know, it's not like that God is saying that, oh, well, yeah, you know, these, these, these two people are going to mess up and they'll need a way to procreate. So we'll need male and female. 
no, no, no. He's, he's saying there's something that there's so much, something deeper than this. And so we have to understand that the, the church has always seen the human person, this body and soul, and, and has a noose, which is, you know, a heart. We have a heart. And that the heart, the, the center of the person, um, is fallen. And so this, this heart that we have, this noose that we have, that's the fancy Greek word that seminarians are only allowed to use in their second year. But, you know, but it's, you know, it's, we, we see it, we're like, what is that? But, you know, I mean, we could translate it as heart. Um, uh, that in the seat of that center of that person, you know, is our reasoning faculty, as well as our spiritual faculty, our spiritual eyes. And that that noose that was that was created by God um, is it's distorted, and so it's no wonder that we see things about ourselves in a distorted view. This is this is this you know this is humanity one hundred and one. You know, as we've always all right. So so let, let's let's stop there because you're you're saying some really important things. So the idea here is you're saying that when God created humans, he created male and female, this is the information that we get from the scriptures, people that do not put their uh, uh, trust in God or in the scriptures will simply discount that, even though they discount it at the experience of, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years of males and females, right? Uh, but that you're saying that the church understands that we have, um, that, that there can be distortions in our self-understanding of who we are as male or female, correct? Yes, yeah. I mean, and that is... That, of course, is what Christ is, uh, you know, what the Apostle Paul is referring to, you know, whenever he says, uh, when he does a callback to Genesis and says, you know, there is neither male or female. And, you know, of course, he says there's neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free. Of course, he's saying this in the context of... uh, the the abuse that had come about based on on people having this distorted understanding of of political power of you know of how people um exercise this power and and of course how you know um uh, females women were treated in in ancient society and so this is of course revolutionary that Christ, all of these things that were distorted, that were broken, that mm. now it's healed in Christ. It's not done away with, as you know, as many of the fathers say, and Father Thomas Hopko has a lovely essay on this. It's not done away with. It's not annihilated. Um, just as my humanness is not, my body is not annihilated. You know, it, it's transformed. And so St. John Chrysostom talks about this on the body and the resurrection. You know, he says that corruptibility is a virus that is foreign to us, but is not who we are. And so when we, are, when we die with Christ in the baptismal font and we are raised anew, that that, that corruptibility is, trans, you know, is traded off for incorruptibility. And he says that the human body is so imbued with grace that even the mere shadow can heal somebody like that. That's the power of the body. That's I say the Orthodox church is very mm. body positive. It's extremely yes, for sure. positive. Extremely. It's God himself not... takes a body. <laughs> right. And so, so this understanding of why this is important to us that we, we don't, uh, our bodies are not our own, first of all. They're not for us to sort of just tinker with and experiment and use in any way that we want. And so this applies to all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, sexual things. Um, 
you know, it's certainly not specific to one particular um, disorder. Uh, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't treat our body as if it's, you know, just something to be to be discarded or tinkered with, and and so we have to find the fullness of of what we were created for in Christ, and that does include gender. You know, the the disparity is so as Saint John Chrysostom says. The disorder that was created around gender at the fall is now put a right in Christ and the Theotokos. This is the prophetic mm. role of these are this is how this this harmony is healed, or this disharmony is healed in Christ and the Theotokos. And now we have those that physical body in the Holy of Holies. And and excellent. You know, and so Father, that, let's, I think that's let's, really important. Yes, thank you very much. So we have a caller that, that just called in, and then we have a question online from our YouTube page. Uh, Dr. Gerasimus, welcome to Ancient Faith Today. You're talking with Father Herman Garrison. Hi, Father Herman. Your blessing. Blessing of the Lord be upon you. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been a psychiatrist for 39 years. I've been retired for two years. In my entire uh, career as a psychiatrist, I never saw a, a single case of this so-called body dysphoria, uh, which wasn't resolved uh, by the age of uh, 17 or 18 years of age. Uh, not a single one. Uh, and as an Orthodox, right. uh, retired Orthodox presbyter, I can only say that my spiritual understanding of this whole transgender and transhumanism movement is it's a, a massive demonic infiltration of our society. It's not so much in Africa, uh, where I where I worked for many years, uh, but it certainly certainly has found its foundation here. Anyway, that's all all I wanted to contribute. Do Doctor, yeah. before you go, um, I I just wanted to ask you, and then I'll let Father Herman uh, respond. Um, are you familiar with any of the literature that I talked about in earlier in the show? Uh, for instance, Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier, uh, The End of yes. Gender by Deborah So, because that yes. that is affirming exactly what you're saying, is that if we would just allow these children to to heal and to you know not push them into a, a kind of a transgender movement, they'll be fine. You know, to be to be uh, uh, transgendered means that you're going to have a lifespan which is half of the normal lifespan. So, if a normal lifespan is 80 years, your your lifespan will be 40 years. Your suicide wow. rate will be up as high as 77 percent. I mean, it, it's it's wow. a it's a, a mark of death. It's a mark of Father death. Herman. Every, every manifestation is evil. Thank you, Doctor. Father Herman? Yeah, that's that's a great point. I want to tease out two things there that, that he brought up, which, yes, you're right. I mean, most uh, most of these things are, you know, heal themselves by uh, this this later teenage uh, years. And, and um, you know, what we're seeing and what, what the social sciences are, are taking a look at is we are now just on the tip of the iceberg on the effects of social media. And there's a, I just read a study last week about, you know, this, this theory positing that perhaps this gender dysphoria is sort of being fueled by the uh, community that's found in, you know, TikTok or, you know, whatever. And that of course, as, as young people, that's, that's the very thing they crave is belonging. And, you know, and what I, te what I emphasize with young people, and, and this was my presentation at, at the youth summer camp last year, um, I cannot emphasize this enough. And I have to remind myself of this. You are not your thoughts, right? You are not your thoughts. Your thoughts, mm -hmm. because we have such a technology mindset, a technological mindset, we have trained ourselves to think of our brains as computers, which is, which is a, a terrible model because the brain is, is far from it. I had a neurologist tell me, he said, we don't even know half of how the brain works. 
and he he did he really disliked this computer model and so the idea is if a thought comes to me that it comes from within my hard drive like that's written on my dna that's written on my hard drive right Right. We don't have the understanding of the logis me, right? Which the Orthodox Church talks about that the evil one is constantly sending us thoughts for us to grab mm-hmm. onto, you know. And um, so we have to. This is why confession is so important. This is why being in a confessional relationship with the church and and bringing these struggles honestly to someone else. You know, there's so many things that we struggle with in private. And when we get locked in our heads, and I'm not talking about just transgenderism or bodies dysmorphia or whatever, this applies to so many of the passion, every passion, right? If you, if you are alone, that's where the devil wants you. He wants you alone and ashamed. And we have to bring it before Christ and lay it to his feet. And, you know, and so, but... To, to his second point, and I think that this is why we struggle as sort of just the average Orthodox Christian, okay? You know, it's like, okay, here's Father Herman, you know, he's got this whatever, he's got this degree. Of course, he got to sit around and talk about it at seminary. But, you know, the struggle that we're facing in our day-to-day lives is this idea of what we're hearing politicians say over and over again with, with these, you know, with this pushback. Well, you want you want to kill children. I mean, that's what they say. Right. I mean, this is right. this is the claim that they make. And so there was a there was a quote uh, that I wanted to pull up by um, a, a transgendered person uh, who they were a a pastor. He was a pastor who transitioned into a woman, and so he gives a TED talk and he talks about uh, you know living as both a man and a woman and and sort of uh, how that that is, but. Um, basically he says, uh, if you are in favor of this new policy, this talking about removing the recognition of transgenderism and expect all of us to detransition, you really only have two options. You're either, you either have to confess your ignorance or you're going to have to accept that you want all of us to die. So, I mean, that's, wow. that's basically the, the sort of emotional burden that right. we are often placed with because, yep. because it's our loved ones. It is our, yeah. our children and our children's friends yeah. and our brothers and our sisters and people that we love dearly. And then we have this cacophony of voices that say, why do you want that person dead? Because they're going, you know, right. that you're just, you're promoting suicide. And I think that that is, that's such, yes. you know, such emotional manipulation. Um, that and that's why to... I think Dr. Garasimos's uh, uh, point is, is very well taken. In other words, the data shows that in fact, <laughs> they will uh, die earlier. They will die sooner, <laughs> the, the right. chances are, if they undergo this. Uh, Dr. Grasmus, I want to ask you if you could hold, Ma- I'm, if you're willing, Matushka Trudy is going to put you back on the line and she's going to ask for your contact information. I'd like to reach out to you after the show. Would that be okay? That would be fine. All right. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your call. Thanks for calling in. All right, Father, um, we're, we're about wrapped up here, but I do want to uh, bring out two comments that uh, are, are on the uh, YouTube page. One is from Tim, and he says, how would you respond to the argument that just as God created day and night that includes dawn and dusk, perhaps the male-female binary may not be strictly either or? Um, and then String Band Mama says, what about those who are born intersex, uh, intersex uh, or eunuchs? But I, I explained to her that eunuchs are those who do change their, their genitalia. So, mm-hmm. so two questions. What about those who are born intersex? And what about the idea that gender may not be strictly male or female because there's dusk and dawn and not just day and night? <laughs> You know, what's interesting is that if we listen to, and you brought this up in your opening statement, which I thought was wonderful. If we listen to the hymnology of the church, it has so much to teach us. 
And this idea, and, and what's interesting is that how the, the genders are meant to, to heal each other. And I remember being struck one day singing in choir, and it was just a quiet vespers. And there was, a, there was this, this line about a, a female martyr res, uh, having obtained manly virtue, right? And then a couple months later, there was another line about, um, you know, this, this saint being sort of, uh, you know, pregnant with the spirit or, you know, this poetic language that's being used. And I think what happens is that what what we often fall into is that um, we fail to see, um, as you pointed out, that uh, we're not saying that you have to be a caricature of what you know basically Hollywood has has sort of um, uh, given us or the ideas that we have. Um, that actually we are to obtain each other's virtues, you know, those things that are strongest in, in our genders, in our, you know, in the sex that God has given us, each one is imbued with, with certain strengths that strengthens the other, that calls the other. And so, um, so I think that people really struggle with this. The reason why they, they're, they're struggling is because they're like, well, you know, I, I do, I don't feel particularly, you know, sort of masculine or, or feminine. And, uh, and I have to think it in, in sort of these binary terms, uh, rather if we, if we humble ourselves and say, yes, there are, there are things that, you know, uh, the, a woman has to teach me, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, my wife will attest to this, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that she has to, that, that she teaches me. And so, uh, you know, the idea, I think, that the binary, um, yeah, it, it's 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 not as as sort of as not as caricature. It's not a caricature that we that we think it is. Um, but there, I mean, there are two. God says, male and female. I mean, this is these are the two right. the two halves. And and you know, I think there was a there was a wonderful. Um, uh, quote by, um, uh, you know, Dr. Timothy Petitsis, uh, whenever he talks about on the ethics of, of beauty, you know, and he says, we have to have, we have to have unity, uh, to, sh you know, and diversity. These, these two things are without unity, there can be no diversity for on what common basis could we then establish differences itself while without diversity, there can be no unity for what would then be left to be unified. And so God, makes it this this binary um this he calls it a chiastic structure um for that particular reason um uh, just quickly moving on to you know intersex people uh you know that is a from my research of what i've i've been able to gather again i'm not a i'm not a medical doctor um but you know there are of course just as in any fallen, you know, in our fallen humanity where we can be born with a, uh, a disability or a, a shortcoming, a, you know, in our bodies. I mean, my, my middle daughter is disabled. She was born with a disability. And so, oh my. Um, and so she, she was actually a brain cancer survivor. She, she lost half her brain. Um, but because she operates with a, you know, a limited intelligence, it's still, doesn't take away the spiritual aspect of her. You know, I mean, St. Right. John, uh, uh, St. Gregory talks about this in, in the body and the resurrection. He says, you know, you lose an arm, you're not less of a person, <laughs> you know, you're still a person. My daughter, because she has lost brain matter, has a, a more limited intelligence, but it has sharpened her spiritual eyes. Um, and so I think people that have this, this, medical condition, first of all, I, I, my understanding is doctors will tell you that uh, chromosomes, their DNA still reads one particular gender. Oftentimes yes, their, skeletal, right. their skeletal structure, the, the pelvis will be either that of a, a male or a female, you know, because the, the, the angle of a pelvis is different in a male and a female. 
So the, the cells that, that which reproduce in their bodies are, are usually one sex and that it's, it's usually limited to, um, you know, a, a deformity in the genitalia. So it's a, it's a category that, again, for an Orthodox Christian um, is unfortunate. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a sort of a, a sign of our fallenness, but we've already established that our, our male and femaleness is not dependent on our, our bodies even, you know, that is something deeper than just our bodies. And so um, I, I think that for people that unfortunately uh, are, are going through that, um, you know, would, would definitely still identify as, as either male or female. Yeah, and the research seems to show that. All right, Father, uh, any last remarks? Maybe um, what would you say to especially young people that are um, questioning, uh, they, they don't feel that they are in the right body, if you will, and they're seeing, uh, you know, famous actors and, and influencers that are, um, you know, that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars and maybe they could do that, you mm -hmm. know, uh, just by going through some kind of transition. Uh, give me a, a couple of, just a brief minute or two on what you would say to them. Let's say first turn off TikTok. I mean, I'm, I'm being serious about that. It's, I'm not trying to be old man yelling at the clouds here, but you know, there's so much science that is supporting that it is bad for our our mental health and well-being, and that goes for adults as well. But um, it's important to to get in an incarnational community, right? Especially if we are if we are struggling with aspects of our humanity, we have to get into a real place, and the realest place on earth is in the church. I mean, that is that is that is the realest place that you will ever get. Right, um, right. And we have to get outside of ourselves because this is nothing new. The world has always wanted your attention. It wants to, to use your body for its gain. Uh, it does not want you to, to live your full prophetic intention that God has for your life. And so we have to find that out. And sometimes that's a, that's a great struggle. Uh, I just believe me, I know very well how much of a struggle that can be. But if we stay in that echo chamber of, of uh, you know, of negativity, of, of uh, you know, we have to break out of that and get incarnational and, and realize that, um, you know, look to the people that have struggled, that have gone before us, because there are saints who have struggled with this. You know, I mean, St. Mary of Egypt is probably one of the greatest examples we have of a, of a, a saint who has struggled with, you know, the, the view of the body and what the body is for. And mm, good we point. can pray to her and say, you know, St. Mary, pray for me because you know my struggle. You know what it's like mm. to have a body that feels like an enemy to you because it, it constantly drags you into sin and you feel like you have no control over it. And so the saints are there, but most importantly, Christ is there, and we have to run to Amen. him. He's the only sure anchor. Amen. Father Herman, thank you so much for your thoughts tonight. That was really fascinating and very, very helpful. And obviously, we do pray for people that uh, are suffering with this to talk to their priests, to talk to someone who is trusted, get off social media, get off uh, these these absolutely toxic garbage TikTok that is that is uh, uh, putting these ideas into people's heads um, and and turn it off. Read a book. Read a good book. Uh, pray to God. Go to church, and uh, you know get these thoughts out of your head. I think this is where it starts. Father Herman, thank you so much. Best wishes to all of your. Uh, uh, your flock down there, all the work that you're doing. It's very, very exciting. And we hope thank that you. you'll come back and join us soon. Uh, right, thank God you. I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you.
Before I share a few final thoughts, I want to offer my sincere thanks to Father Herman Garrison for joining us tonight. Thanks to Matushka Trudy for engineering the program, to our show production assistant, Melissa Graff, for her work behind the scenes, for everybody that's listening in, and for those who will be listening, and to all you folks online. Good stuff going on, especially on YouTube tonight. All right, two readings here real quick. Genesis 1, it's an obvious one, right? The creation of man and woman. It's where we get our truth. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But Adam, uh, but for Adam, there was not a, a helper found comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then Ambrose of Milan, St. Ambrose says, not without significance too is the fact that woman was made out of the rib of man. She was not made of the same earth with which he was formed in order that we might realize that the physical nature of both man and woman is identical and that there was one source for the propagation of the human race. For that reason, neither was man created together with a woman, nor were there two men and two women created at the beginning, but first a man and after that a woman. God willed it that human nature be established as one. Thus, from the very inception of the human race, he eliminated the possibility that many disparate natures should arise. And that's our show for tonight. Remember to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ancientfaithtoday. Share out our program after that's posted. Give us your feedback and contact us with any ideas or topics that you might want to hear about. Join us next Tuesday evening for another edition of Ancient Faith Today. Good night, everybody.